welcome to episode 6 of season 2 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Monday the 8th of June 2009 and I'm Simon. With me this week, it's rather full, but we'll start off with Tony. Hello oh, mate, you alright? Yeah, not bad. How's Busy your week. knee? Yeah, I've got a bad knee, I've been doing far too much running. It's looking good though. Well, well thank you. quite healthy on it. <laughs> See, this is why you shouldn't do exercise. It's it good leads for to the, you. No, no, no. Embarrassing conversations between men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like on these too. <laughs> Nobly knees. Um, yeah, so I'm back on the internet. Really? Which is good news. So, do you know what it was? No, they've not told me. <laughs> two, two week outage, and it suddenly came back one evening. And uh, I've put in a re- request saying, um, Can you tell me what the problem was, please? And I haven't heard anything since. I'm satisfied he actually forgot to put the cable in and he just realised that. But he, to save face, he's not going to admit that to us. If it, if it didn't miraculously come back on when I was in the car on the way home from work, you could possibly have a point. But sadly, I was, uh, <laughs> it I was, was out of the house at the time. It was Laura, Laura wasn't it? <laughs> it's it's some remote thing that somebody obviously at the exchange has unplugged the cable and worked out where it should go. It's technical. Yeah, it's deeply technical. But no, I'm back on the internet and Yay. slightly faster than I was before, which is good to hear. Yeah. Davey, what have you been up to, mate? Oh dear, <laughs> um, I've been doing some stuff and I haven't written my list so I think I'm in trouble with that. Um, but uh, one, one thing I've been doing is, and I'm sure we'll mention it later in the show, is um, I've because there's people who are aware of what PPAs are, yeah? Yep, uh, personal that, package archives. That's the one, so you can basically make your own archive very easily. Um, and th- there's been some scripts and things bouncing around to import PPA keys, and you have to add you have to add it by going to the console or opening up different is things. It, uh, this is this is GPG keys with which you authenticate the packages you put in your archive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but also, can, they can be sure they come from the right place. Yeah, but also to actually add to the archive, you need to edit your sources dot list or insert a text file in a certain location. Are you going somewhere with this? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Now okay. I've actually uh, created a PPA of. PPA. So you you install a wow. so so for example you might have uh, Tony Whitmore slash PPA okay. and you just apt get install that and it adds the PPA to your system and wow. then to remove that PPA you just remove that. That's Sorry, very that. meta. You lost me at PPA. <laughs> <laughs> there'll, there'll be a blog post explaining it. I'm sure. Oh good. Let's read all. Let's read that instead. Okay. And um, Al is here. Oh, isn't yeah. he supposed to ask? That? Yeah, I know. He, yes, we, right. he, he just looked confused. We have consistently <laughs> not got that bit right. <laughs> Simon ages. just looked confused, but I think now, he glazed over when Dave yeah, was talking was about breaking yeah. back up. Sorry. <laughs> it was exciting stuff. Now, Alan, you right. actually look quite tanned, and you're back from your secret location now. Yeah, it's not that secret, really. It was Spain. So <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Oh, I didn't go to the moon or anything, but no, I was on holiday in Spain with the family, and that's why I wasn't in the episode last week. Mate, last that's week just before. not good enough. No. no, I know. It's lacking. Yeah. So, what have you been doing, Alan? Um, well, other than sitting in the sun, um, yeah, actually a fair bit playing with stuff. And um, one of the things that I played with that I was um, quite chuffed with was um, I got an iPod, which, okay, yes, evil. Hater. Uh, <laughs> More of which later. Yeah, which isn't mine. It's It, belong, <laughs> it's, it belongs to the wife. <laughs> but that means I've got her iPod. So she's she's got the one I got, an iPod Nano, little diddly thing. And I've got her old iPod video. And I was trying to synchronize it on um, uh, on Ubuntu. And I tried loads of different things like Rhythm Box and Banshee, and yeah, I had fun synchronizing it. And eventually. did you get any of them to work? Yeah, uh, well, on the iPod video, they all work, but on the little Nano, the new brand new little mm. Nano that you can shake to shuffle, the only thing that would do it is um, Songbird, and none of the others Banshee, and that See, would work. I thought they all had like a shared lib iPod or something now where they all shared the same library to actually interface with the iPod. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, I thought there was. And, well, there may well be, but. <laughs> <laughs> because they've got to, they've Maybe, still, the application still got to have hooks into the into the library, and I they, guess the it? version that's in um, Ubuntu, the version of whatever that library is ban- that Banshee uses or that Rhythmbox uses, isn't up to date enough for those iPods. So that's why I downloaded Songbird, and that seemed to work all right. It was a bit slow, but it's quite neat. Awesome. Okay, Simon, have you got anything that you've been doing over the last couple of weeks you want to recap on? Oh, other yeah. than uh, other than looking been, very healthy. Oh, thank you, man. What have you been doing? Running lots. Um, no, apart from I tried that, to give him a hint there, but it didn't work, <laughs> did it? I've been, uh, I've been having a lot of fun with, with, uh, with man. Oh, ma- <laughs> not, not a man. Is that something uh, you want to read? Uh, 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 uh. No, you know, I'm uh, quite impressed with uh, Biobu, which is the replacement for screen profiles. Oh yeah, oh, I've yeah, been yeah. Um, chatting with uh, Dustin Kirkland about that and sort of jumped on board. Um, the man for uh, Biobu is pretty much non-existent, so I said, "Well, kids ago." So I'm rewriting man or writing man and um, the, doc- the documentation basically. The documentation. Oh, cool. Yeah. Wow. So I'm learning about bizarre and uh, man because there's a man for man, and, uh, <laughs> which is really there always. Me. I wasn't ready for that one. <laughs> so that was a good 
a couple of hours. <laughs> and I'm getting deeper into screen as well. And um, yeah, it's a good learning experience. Wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. We should get to uh, talk to you a little bit more about that in detail in a future episode, I think. Yeah, make sure I'm not here for that, will you? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Excellent. So what's in the show this week, then? We've got an interview with the Allens from the Open Learning Centre. Okay. We've got news and events. Davey's going to be on IRC. <laughs> <laughs> We've got events. Yep. Thanks, Dave. Again. <laughs> for the second time this evening. <laughs> <laughs> we may talk about your email. We're going to do what? the com- we're going to do the competition. Uh, we've got the ecosphere, which um, apparently last time I wasn't here, it was called Gerald. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm. Now that you're here, do we have to call it something sensible again. Yes. Okay. We got a stack of feedback from the last um, show, so we're going to um, screen through that. Oh, and we've got a competition, and the results from the last competition. Oh yeah. Oh, Sounds like a fun pack show. <laughs> We're very pleased to have with us um, two more Allens, as if there wasn't enough Allens here. What, one is more than enough, arguably. <laughs> There's oh, never you, enough Allens. never get enough Allens. Thanks very much. <laughs> We've got Alan Lord and Alan Bell from the Open Learning Centre. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. Um, we first, I think we first met at the uh, Linux World Expo in London. It was one of the first times we met, I think. Mm. And you guys had a stand there and you had loads of little diddy laptops. What kind of stuff were you doing there at the uh, the Expo? Uh, we, were, um, we were there with a, 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 my partner here alan bell is a part-time cto of an organization called the open forum europe okay Um, we do quite a lot of work with them we help them and they're a lobbying organization and they lobby uh uh, governments at at the european level um to promote open source and open standards in it okay so stuff like the omxml that kind of stuff yeah indeed Uh, very much so okay (laughs) and you were there to make up the numbers or (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's putting it kind <laughs> okay um we were representing them at the show uh along with some of their um sort of permanent staffers i went out to uh to G- geneva with them on the the oxml project all yeah. oh, right so were you presenting to people in the the european parliament or government um, or? no we were r- running a um a conference alongside the uh, the BRM on standards and the future of the internet. And I was oh. um, uh, running uh, a little stand demonstrating uh, the power of free and open source software and ODF compatible office applications. And were, were you finding people who were already aware of all of this, or was it was it new to them? Or? At that conference, it was uh, an audience that was there to see that sort of thing. Oh, right. There was a lot of um, standards geeks. Oh, <laughs> With, with uh, very large tomes of standards documents. Well, the OXML one pages. was very large. 6,000 pages? Crikey. And did you read it? <laughs> Every page. <laughs> Are you going to read it to uh, us now? No, I didn't read that. I've uh, read a lot of the ODF stuff, but not, not that much of the OOXML. Cool. Excellent. It's not so, that interesting. Well, it's cryptic. <laughs> um, at the expo, you had loads of um, sort of netbooks and different makes and things like that kicking around. Um, was that what you were uh, there to display, particularly? Well, no, what we were, we were using them to, to show the various open source operating systems that were available and the fact that, especially at that time when we were there, uh, it was quite early on in the netbook um, sort of history, I guess, and yeah. almost all of them, when they first came out, were running some version of Linux or another. Mm. Mm. Uh, so it was a good, it's a good way to, to show people what, what open source software can do. And you were, if I remember correctly, you were right opposite the Ubuntu stand, which is where we were. Yeah. Which is how, and it wasn't that busy an expo. <laughs> so we ended up spending uh, quite a lot of time nice. on each other's stands and uh, playing with all the bits of kit and everything. Um, and you had kind of one of every single netbook going. You had uh, one laptop per child and you had uh, the e, e um, ACCs and all that sort of stuff. It was a very impressive collection. Oh, so okay. is that part of something that the Open Learning Centre does? Uh, or, yes. Well, it's sort of a... Sort of. Yeah, it's... Partly a private collection. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Put it in a glass case and yeah, have but, people uh, come around and see it. I, I used to we like those match- little things. I used to collect Matchbox cars when I was, uh, when I was younger. Um, but that would be a be, cheaper obsession. Yeah, but, but you guys collect uh, netbooks, do you? <laughs> so <laughs> on the subject range. of hardware, um, you also have uh, on your website something called a Libertas server oh, what's all yeah, that about libertus libertus yeah, i'm not very good at latin yeah. sorry yeah. i didn't do it at school i'm not classically trained yeah this is a what's... new project for us it's a new um what we've done is we've taken a um perhaps i'll say first of all what we do the the open learning center is a really we're a software consulting organization and we specialize in free software we work on sort of two levels really the first is is what we've just discussed we help 
we've helped in the past some vendors to understand how to use free software and what some of the implications are to do with licensing and that sort of thing. Right. That's one aspect of what we're doing. The other aspect is we help companies use free software in their business. So we identify the right products for them and help them install, implement, deploy, and, and support it. Um, and is that server stuff or desktop stuff or both? Both. both. Okay. Yeah, we're not, we don't, um, we don't restrict ourselves on uh, vertical or horizontally. <laughs> Ooh, get you. Does that include Ubuntu then in the <clears throat> things that you help uh, Absolutely. Well, yeah. we, we, we're pretty exclusive on Ubuntu now. I mean, we're an Ubuntu, we're a canonical partner. Uh-huh. We have a we have an Ubuntu solution provider badge on our website. Oh, Excellent. Yeah. For so the benefit of our listeners, um, I think uh, Alan is actually quite pleased about that. You know, <laughs> he, 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 yeah, he did look quite happy. Well done, well done. Oh, so the uh, so what does the the Libertus server um, do? What is it? Is it a like home office type thing, or is it a? It's uh, it's a a package. There are there's a, a range of Libertus servers which do different things. Um, uh, the the libertus cognatio. Um, <laughs> oh, 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 oh! They were lots of Latin terms, and right. uh, we had a lot of help from uh, various members of the Hampshire lug, uh, <laughs> pointing out your grammatical <laughs> errors, our, our <laughs> grammatical errors on our participles not matching our something or others. If, uh, if there was one lug in the country that was going to correct your Latin vocab, it was going to be Hampshire <laughs> lug, isn't it? But they're, they're targeted at um, businesses. Right. Yeah. Yes. So okay. the, the the cognatio is is um, uh, the 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 hardware, a little server that um, is powerful enough to do the job, uh, running Ubuntu and the VTiger customer relationship management application. Never heard of that. What what is it? Web based thing? Uh, web based CRM. Web based okay. PHP uh, customer relationship management system that manages. Is it good? Contacts. Yes, yeah. it's very good. Yeah, we think so. We use it. All right, excellent. Mm. It was it was a very early fork of sugar. I was going to say sugar's the one. So it was forked from sugar just before they they changed their license. About um, I I forget the time, but it's uh, quite a few years ago now. They 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 changed their license to uh, make it quite hard for people to copy and redistribute the sugar software. Uh I didn't know that. Yeah, it's it's they've put in they 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 put in some. um, uh, sort of brandware kind of licensing issues so oh, you have to have the sugar logo like in places and did. things like that and it's yeah. so it's become quite hard and if you look at sugar now they've they've gone quite heavily down the SaaS route mm, if, if right. you look on their website it's not obvious that you can actually download the software in the first I, place I you didn't have to really like look could, for actually. it I, I thought it was software <clears> service no no you can get the source code but, right. but, but anyway so V Tiger just before they changed the license or they took the, the release before the, before they changed the license and they fought that and they've gone down a very different route where it is fully open source. There are no sort of professional enterprise add-ons that you have to pay for. So the right. whole code is is under an open source license. Oh, that's good. Now, I mean, obviously, Sugar CRM is the golden child. Um, but does VTiger bring anything that Sugar doesn't do? Uh, it brings complete free and open source stack, which <laughs> hey. is the most important thing for us. Yeah. Um, and I think in terms of the usability, there's... I'm not really. I've not really used Sugar that much, but from from people that I've discussed it with in the past, they think that the V Tiger has got a very different user interface to Sugar now. Over the last few years, it's changed quite a lot, and they've gone in very different directions. So V Tiger is very much focused on the SME, uh, and it packs an awful lot of functionality into a quite a small and neat. So, so is SME your target audience? Is it? Mm, yeah, for the moment, we're not big enough to to really help the very large organizations and will that be provided as a as a like a black box solution or heavily customized or is it is it kind of you know you buy it off the shelf and we put it in and that away um, it goes well part of the package is we put it in so mm-hmm. it comes with a day's consulting uh, so we're, we're not doing this as a as a mail order right box in the post sort of uh, mm. proposition so it's, you do some tailoring for each customer uh, i guess yeah we'll, yeah. we'll come and deliver it pre-installed and configured and spend the day setting it up in the right place on the network working out where it goes in terms of IP addresses and demilitarized zones and such like, um, and then spend the rest of the day showing the customer how to use it and maybe customizing it and, or importing some data into it and so, giving so them a running this is, start. So this is like an appliance server that just sits mm. on the network yeah. where the end user isn't necessarily aware they're using Ubuntu or a free software as such. Um, it just sits on the network and does its job. I mean, is that... It's, um, yeah, but we make we don't hide the fact that it's free software. That's an advantage yeah, that we're, yeah, we're yeah. 
we, we, we're not trying to say this is a black box that just does stuff. We're saying this is free and open source software. Mm. Look at this Ubuntu desktop. It's great. Yeah. Now, um, so something that interests me about this is how are you actually um, sorting out upgrades and, and updates as well? I mean, I mean, do, do you, is this got this like a hard drive in there, or, or and you 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 do the updates, or are they automatic, or do they do them via the client? I mean, I mean, how how, how do you do that? Okay, that's it. It, it can vary. Um, we're thinking about using Landscape to manage them, oh. um, or, and other other means. Basically, it's it's an Ubuntu. Um, an Ubuntu server or an Ubuntu desktop uh, build and gets updates just like any other. Oh, yeah, yeah but what I mean is, uh, do you expect the end user... I mean, is it basically like a washing machine appliance that just sits in the corner and does its job and stays up to date? Or, or is that something that, that a, you... Is it a managed service, basically? You know, you, you deal with mm -hmm. any of the system issues. We offer, we offer a managed service as a, as, right. a, as a sort of continuation of the purchase. So you can buy the appliance... Um, for the for the for the for a fixed price basis, you get the box, you get the software, and you get us for a day. Uh, if you if that's all they need, then fine, they can walk away at that point. If they want us to, we will offer them um, remote overnight backup. So we'll do an overnight backup to one of our servers every day. Mm -hmm. We'll do a hardware replacement service, and we'll offer ongoing support services if they want. All to. the usual kind of stuff you yeah. expect, mm -hmm. man. Yeah. yeah, marvelous. But none of it is. You must buy this. Mm. You must buy this subscription. Right. It's mm. And obviously, because it's free and open software, you know anyone can hopefully pick it up if if need be. You know, exactly. Their own yeah. people or whoever. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've got some questions from our listeners on uh, Twitter and Identica. Um, Apache UK has asked he'd like to get more open source tools into his job, um, but he has a, has a t hard time convincing his management. Have you got any tips or tricks that you can use to uh, help him get some Ubuntu in there? Uh, do, do a costed comparison. Uh, throw it in as a, as an equal option against a number of other uh, other items, depending on what project it is you're you're you're, com you're contemplating. Um, another thing that uh, was a great idea that, to come out of uh, the CIO office of the government, which is possibly mm. the first great idea that the government has had. <laughs> um, Certainly, is this government. This yeah. government. Yeah. Well, um, well, hang on, we're recording it on uh, on Monday night. We don't know what's going to happen by the end. <laughs> yeah. Whatever the current government yeah. is, yeah, um, was to they, they've asked public sector employees tendering for uh, projects to ask the tenderers to include the exit costs of the the, the solutions they're considering. Oh, is, is that the sort of uh, antidote to lock-in? Is that is that trying to basically get out of vendor vendor lock-in? Yeah, it's putting the lock-in price up front. Wow. So mm. you're never totally locked into any solution mm. you you can sit and you know with two terminals and read off one and type into another and you can mm. get your data out <laughs> the hard way lock-in is a cost issue and it's getting that cost issue evaluated up front at the time of purchase mm. so if you're looking at doing doing a, a project and there are three different solutions one of which is free and open source software include the the exit costs of all of them as well and that really shows the value that's a very good idea um the other question was from kiris who says he may be a bit late but he'd like to ask you if you do linux training for things like apache and command line use and bash scripting and stuff um no not really <laughs> <laughs> fair enough that's easy uh, we generally most of our training focuses on um business end users uh, rather than technical Nerds. geeky stuff mm -hmm. so we do the technical geeky stuff but we don't train the technical geeky stuff yes i've done quite a bit we on do joomla, joomla. yeah i've done quite a lot of joomla training for web design companies and that sort of thing i've actually noticed uh, on your blog posts yeah you do some joomla and wordpress stuff and then something else i've come across um is that you're you're, you're a fan of mono is, is that is that fair to say <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> so, you may have misread one of our posts. Oh, oh okay, okay. Because there, ha there have been a number of them. Um, yeah. So I mean, um, so I mean, without going too much into the blog post, I mean, what, what, why, what is it you don't like about mono? I mean, for those that don't know, is mono's. Um, well, you, you explain mono. So mono is is a compatibility layer. Um, it it allows a .NET application to run on Linux, um, which is very useful if you have a .NET application that you want to run on Linux. Much like Wine does for Windows um, executables that are that are unmanaged code, to use the the t terminology, and Wine is is a compatibility la la layer. Both Wine and Mono have questionable. 
Well, it's no, questionable, right. questionable legal um, legal status or uh, well, certainly ethical status. Mm. Yes, I mean, mm. people people seem to worry about Mono that because Microsoft control the stack and and, and in charge of sort of developing the the .dot net framework, that we're going to port lots of applications over to Mono, and then Microsoft will do something nasty and take them all away the from us, out. pull the rug from underneath them. Yeah, mm. that's yeah. a that's a possibility. It's possibly, possibly. Yeah. Uh, my view is that. It's a useful tool if you have the problem that it solves. Which Why is? put your so, well running .dot net? If you have a, if you have a .dot net right. application okay. that you want to run, mm. then Mono is the useful tool to solve that mm. problem. If you start out from a position of not having that problem, why create it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, for example, FSpot, which I understand is uh, is, a, is a GDK, so it's native to to GNOME rather than Windows, isn't it? Um, but it, I mean that that uses .NET, so so that addresses, uses Mono. Uh, uses Mono. Sorry, yeah, uses Mono. So so that addresses the problem that, that you're saying that's been invented because it was actually written from start to use that, rather than a system which which may have come from Windows and you actually want to run it on on a, on a Linux desktop. So yeah, I, I see what you're saying there, and that, that, that sounds quite quite reasonable. Yeah, I think it's a great tool, and it's a superb thing to have in the repositories uh, as a as an option for people who want it. Cool. Um, you mentioned that your um, partners, Ubuntu partners, yeah. is that right? Canonical, yeah. canonical, canonical partners. partners. Yeah. So, what does that entail? Is that, is that um, so you can use the brand name on your products, or is that um, yeah. does it have much um, in the way of meaning? Or we can we've a, we have a, a logo that we can use for our company, not for our products as such, um, unless they go through Ubuntu compatibility testing. Oh, really? Well, you have to send the kit off yes. if you want. Really? Yes. Yeah. It's just like any other OEM, OEM kind of arrangement. Right. And they send us scary letters sometimes. <laughs> we got a great one today, this morning. Right. I had to sign for this um, this document that came through the... Oh, that this never chap, this good, chap, Yeah, it? this chap arrived, and I had to sign for this document. It was addressed to the other Alan, <laughs> and, who wasn't in. So I said... Um, so I got hold of him, and I said, oh, have you seen... I've just sent, I sent him an email, and then he got me on IRC. And I said, have you read your email? And he went... Ugh. And it was from the old Bailey... Oh dear! It's a firm of lawyers near the old Bailey. I thought, what's this? I said to him, "What's this?" And he said, well, "I don't know." I said, "Shall I open it?" He went, okay. <laughs> so I opened the opened the plastic envelope. Inside was a brown envelope, sealed, addressed to him. Brown is the worst. Nothing on it, just brown with the with his Alan Bell Goat Maloney sensor. I said, to him, "Shall I open that?" He went, "Open that." So I opened it. <laughs> and to our to our relief. Um, Canonical have changed. It looks like they've they've done something where they've changed their um, their company sort of registration. It used to be in the Isle of Man, and it's, oh, it now, it's now in no, it's now in the UK. Oh, okay. And it's basically we have to re-sign an NDA. Ah, uh, phew. But there was a, there was quite a scary <laughs> moment for a little while this morning. <laughs> oh man, I, I, I wasn't aware that, that being a solution provider, you had to agree to an NDA. Is is that something that uh, that was to do with some other projects we've worked on right. in the past? I was going to say because I mean, obviously, you, perhaps you couldn't tell us about that because <laughs> it's in the NDA. <laughs> something, something I um, actually I wanted to mention the um, related to signing license and agreements and that you've recently blogged about using um, a bit of software that I also use, um, Miserware. And um, I just wondered how you'd be getting on with it. Uh, brilliant! I think it's um, it's been um, well. I, I, I think the last thing I said on my blog about it was you, you, I've installed it and basically forgotten it's there. <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 had no noticeable impact on um, on the, the the performance of the machines I've installed it on uh, on my um, on my sort of netbook that I take around. I haven't done a proper test on it, but I've seen it's probably gets it give me 30 minutes more life on my battery so oh, good seems to be working very well yeah excellent so um i'll um we'll put a link into your blog uh, so people can find out more about that and um, okay excellent. yeah try that themselves okay now there are a number of people out there calling themselves the open learning center or variations they're on which one are you which is where, which website can people go to uh, find the, out more? the open learning com. okay none of the others and it's center spelt properly yeah, yeah. <laughs> the european <laughs> version yeah, yes the right so that's c-e-n-t-e-r no no uh, <laughs> thanks dave okay well thanks for coming in alans and uh oh thanks <laughs> oh not me <laughs> uh, thank you for thank asking you for, us i knew it was going to get messy <laughs> thanks for coming in and talking to us The 
Free Software Foundation are hiring a campaigns manager to work on Defective by Design and Playog. The job is based out of Boston, Massachusetts, and is only open to US residents. Mm. And it's a unionised job and pays about 50000 US dollars. Which is handy about. being on the event UK podcast. <laughs> well, I thought it might be useful for, you know, <laughs> there was our, a... our US listeners. Yeah, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with campaigning for uh, freedom. Google have released a developer version of Chromium, the open source bits of the Chrome browser for Linux from Google. Mm. So there's already, there's already a PPA on Launchpad, but now Google have got their own site. Well, yeah, the PPAs were built by a Ubuntu developer, um, and now these are actually binaries built by Google. Do they work? Mm. I don't know, I've not tried them actually. I'm, I'm using the PPA. <laughs> yeah, I'm using the PPA as well and it works fine. More on Chrome. Uh, Google are bundling the uh, lesser GPL media software FFmpeg uh, with Chrome to allow their browsers to support the new video element in uh, HTML5. Now, this has got some people hot under the collar as they think that uh, Google might be breaching the lesser GPL uh, by redistributing software covered by patents requiring royalty payments. Mm. It was it, riveting. Well, it kind of came out on one of the mailing lists that, that um, Google are licensing something, and they, it kind of came out on the on the sly. It wasn't very open. It kind of got a few people a bit twitchy. Popular web filtering system Sensornet have moved their product from running on Debian to Ubuntu. They plan to create an easy self-install CD which will automatically install the filtering web proxy software uh, automatically. <laughs> <laughs> You use this, don't you, Tony? Yeah, we use it at work, and I used it in my previous work as well. And it's uh, it's really good. Do you I, feel suitably censored? <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I have the keys to the uh, to the system, so I can unfilter anything I like. Ah. Uh, sysadmins have all the power in the world. Mm. The um, the old installer used to just blat the hard drive, didn't it? It was just yes. like a you get like two questions and then done. Really easy to install. It was really easy to install. So hopefully, the Ubuntu version is GUI based, but just as easy. Cool. A new netbook distro called Jolly Cloud has been released. It claims to support a growing list of Wi-Fi cards, 3G modems and Bluetooth devices out of the box. But the really different thing about Jolly Cloud is that it stores all your data in the cloud. Centred around social applications like Twitter, Facebook and network applications like Gmail and Skype, it's designed to present the same desktop on all your netbooks. Mm. It looks very pretty, I have to say. It does look pretty, but whether it's my definition of cloud, um, how do you pronounce... I don't know. I'm not sure I agree with that. Scout. What? What? I mean, <laughs> okay. It, the, uh, it's saying a lot of the applications are cl- cloud. I'm not. I'm not saying it's a cloud. I don't think it's a cloud OS. Do they say it's a cloud OS? Yeah. Oh, do they? Is it, that what they call it's it? Not, it's not just a cloud. It's a happy. It's a jolly. Well, it's that, a jolly cloud OS. The idea is you can install it on all your netbooks and have the same environment and the same data on each mm. of them because all of your data is in the cloud. But the, I mean, it, the way it's doing it is is purely Dropbox client. Anyway. Anyway. Red Hat have stirred up a debate around Mono by replacing Tomboy with Gnote and dropping Mono from the live CD entirely, citing a lack of space on the disc. Yeah, a few people have been saying, oh, it's nothing to do with space, it's all the old, the anti-Mono brigade. Well, we love Mono. It's fantastic. Apparently we do. The informatics department at the University of Sussex are working on a usability study for Ubuntu 9.04 with Canonical over the summer. The researchers are looking for Brighton residents to take part in short, i.e. 45 minutes to an hour, demonstration sessions in their own homes for a £40 payment incentive from the 16th to the 27th of June. The data will help lead towards redesign proposals for the next major release of Ubuntu. Users can also complete a short survey aimed to build a profile of current Ubuntu users. Together, the community can make Ubuntu even better. I'm doing this. I'm moving to sunny Kelly Brighton. surprise. <laughs> you don't live in Brighton? No, I, I work near Brighton. Yeah. Really? It's not just for the 40 quid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to help make Ubuntu better, all right? We'll put a link to the survey in the, um, in the show notes. Coming up this weekend is a new conference for free software authors writing open source. It's being held on the 12th to the 14th of June in Owen Sound, Canada, being run by Emma Jane Holpin, everyone's favourite book writer, who we interviewed earlier this season. Surrey and Hampshire Linux user groups are holding a joint meeting this Saturday the 13th of June, and uh, apparently Alan, well, one of the three Alans, uh, Alan that, Pope, that would be me, is giving a short talk about his recent bug-fixing experiences on Ubuntu. Yeah, it should be good fun. It's going to be at um, Nokia in um, Farnborough, and you have to... Um, 
there's some details on the wiki. It, you have to register beforehand so the security guys don't go funny at you. Southeast USA Linux Fest will be on June the 13th this year in Clemson, South Carolina. For more information, southeastlinuxfest.org. The first ever open video conference will take place on June the 19th and 20th in New York City. Speakers include DVD John and hackers from Firefox, VLC, Miro and more. UK Unix user group Open Tech on 4th of July in London. <laughs> Although it says here London, London. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. So good they named it twice. Europython 2009 is running from Saturday, Sunday the 28th of June to Saturday the 4th of July at the Conservatoire in Birmingham uh, in the UK. More details at europython.eu and listen out for the results of our very special competition later in the show. Open Source Schools Unconference at NCSL's Conference Centre in Nottingham will be on Monday the 20th of July. And understand there might be someone speaking there. That would be me. Oh, cool. Now, it's a good job I didn't criticise Alan for plugging his talk earlier in this event section. Otherwise. Yeah, you snuck that one yeah. in, didn't you? Yeah, I'm talking about virtualization and uh, what we've done with it at work. Remember, Software, Software Freedom Day this year is on Saturday the 19th of September. We're well, not going to make the gags about Pirate Day no, again. I'm not going to talk about Pirate Day. Lug Radio Live is on the 24th of October this year at Newham Arts Centre in Wolverhampton. And we're, are we going to be there? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be there. Who said no? I so, said no. Uh, oh, okay. I can't think that far ahead. So while I was away in Spain, you guys had a fantastic competition. Yeah, brilliant competition. And who? what was it and who was the winner? They wouldn't let me enter. <laughs> yeah, we... we, we... <laughs> Barred Simon from entering. Um, the competition was to win uh, entry to the three talk days at Europython 2009, which is happening in Birmingham uh, at the end of the end of this month, actually. And two nights accommodation were included as well. So you had to get yourself to Birmingham. But basically, once you're there, you why can... do you say Birmingham with a Brummie accent then? Birmingham, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, goodness knows why. Um, but it was a really fantastic prize, and the Europython uh, organisers donated to us. So thank you very much indeed to them. Um, and they set the question themselves, which, which quite, was a bit harder. It than was normal. quite tricky, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, what was the uh, question, Simon? The question was: uh, Which speaker is so relaxed about his database that he has a rest? And we actually had to ask them what the right answer was because <laughs> none of us could work it out. That's right. We, the, we were inundated with with answers, weren't we? Cool. Yeah. The right answer was Mikhail Rogers. Works for me. Sounds right. Um, M I K E A L. Who's talk, doing a talk about databases and rests? Hence the question, being a little bit cryptic. He's the couch DB guy, apparently. Ah, which is something to do with databases and sofas. Right. Um, the, <laughs> uh, and the winner was... Alan Pope. No, sadly not. <laughs> uh, this is such a big competition, we should put a drum roll in here in the edit. Um, the winner is Jason Licorice. Yay. Congratulations, uh, Jason. Who's known as that? Bassett's on IRC. Should we set a new competition? Sounds like a good idea to me. And this is a, a bit of a competition, a bit of a throwback to season one. Um, you might remember back in episode 11, I think it was, of oh, season one. Good memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's about that. Sure. He we checked sat, that. We sat out in our back garden and talked about um, the Viglund MPC, these tiny little boxes um, running 400 megahertz AMD Geo CPU, 80 gig disk and half a gig of RAM. Impressive yep. memory. Hey, uh, and a free USB pen drive. Yes. And a keyboard and mouse that made the box huge. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So tiny box, about the size of a CD case, and uh, a box that was all packaged in um, was about the size of a computer, uh, like a full tower system. Anyway, um, the offer apparently is still on. We yeah. thought it had wrapped up in December, um, but Viglin have been in touch and told us you can still get hold of these MPCLs. For... They actually contacted us. They yeah. emailed us to tell us, tell your listeners they can still get hold of them. Yeah, for the offer price, which we had last season, which was £79. It includes all the things that Dave and, and Alan mentioned. Um, but you can get your hands on one of these systems for even less. As you can enter the competition, they've given us another one yeah. to give away. So you can enter the competition to win it, and it won't cost you anything. Um, and so we've got a question, and Simon, do you know what's the question? Okay, the, the Viglin MPCL has approximately the same footprint as A, a matchbox, B, a CD case, C, a DVD case, D, Roger Bannister in 1954. Email your answer to competition at ubuntu-uk.org by Sunday the 21st of June. Um, and unfortunately, for shipping reasons, we can only open this up to European economic area and uh, North America. When you say shipping reasons, you mean being tight. 
<laughs> well, yeah, it's caused problems in the past, <laughs> getting these things to far fun places of the world. H- has the winner from the first one actually got theirs now? Uh, the Macedonian uh, gentleman, <laughs> yes, I believe so. Well, it left, the, it left here. <laughs> um, they don't track things in Macedonia. It's time for the Gerald this time. Uh, no. Week. What? It's the ecosphere. Uh, it, oh. I'm, I'm now, back, so we're calling it the ecosphere. We, we could have a vote. You can try. I'm going to edit it. <laughs> Scott James Remnant from the Ubuntu desktop team has posted a presentation he gave at UDS regarding boot speed improvements in the upcoming 9.10 and 10.04 releases. Scott is using the now discontinued Dell Mini 9 as a reference platform and has got a target of 10 seconds to a fully automatic logged in desktop. That's cool. On a G- uh, atom based processor. I don't know, whatever a Dell Mini, Mini 9, 9 or the, 10, the 10V, same thing. That's fast. I mean, I know we talked before about boot speed and whether it's just sort of chasing stats for the sake of it. But he's, he's broken it down in his mail and said, like, you know, I think XOR gets two seconds to start and the kernel gets two seconds. And he's broken down that 10 seconds and allocated it or chopped it all up for all the different bits and bobs. It's, it's ambitious. Lives releases 0.99 recurring, uh, uh, amusing if you add more nines. <laughs> Which is almost certainly the last release before 1.0 pre-1. So get testing and file bugs if you want to see it before 1. Now, Lives is a sort of video editor. Video DJ video thing. Video jockey type thing. So you can do live effects and you, you kind of supposedly use it for offline video stuff as well. Hmm. The Community Council has met to discuss the use of the Ubuntu name uh, in the Ubuntu One platform, as we discussed before. Whilst most people recognise Canonical's right to do what they want with the Ubuntu trademark, some people think using it for this new service isn't in the spirit of the trademark policy, which everyone other than Canonical has to follow. Yeah, it's tricky. It was a, it was a, an interesting meeting, and a few people kind of badgering Mark with the same question over and over again, but worded differently. And um, you can see people raising valid concerns about it. Was it was it, a bit, no, this is how we're doing it. It's already decided. It was, yeah, kind of, no, we're going to do it this way. But they did listen to other suggestions for names and, uh, you know, who well, knows? And then it was jog did, on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And now the meeting's over. Off did, you go. did anybody suggest Gerald as a better name? No. Oh, damn, I missed it now. In an interesting twist to the spat between Adblock Plus and NoScript, Adblock Plus are showing off a potential new feature enabling webmasters to ask their visitors if they'd like to enable advertising on a site-per-site basis. Something the user can already do manually, this allows the webmaster to force Adblock Plus to ask the question. So the idea behind this is is you're going to a website, Mm. and you know the little bar that comes at the very, very top of Firefox? Yeah. The webmaster can put like a meta tag on their page that forces that to appear and say... Hey, I would really you like to see the advert? That, yeah, that is such a feature I really want. <laughs> yeah, well, some people do because you know some people want to actually want to look at adverts. Um, well, no, they want to they want to um, experience help the website with all the flashingness and, and the banners. Do you and want the... this pump? Oh, <laughs> get lost, all of you. A new icon set has been released by the GNOME artwork team called Breathe. The icon set looks to be considered for inclusion in Karmic, but rumor has it it will be up against an icon set which is being designed at cost by a third party for Canonical. Mm. I've had a little look, and it doesn't look a million miles away from the current icon set. No, there's some nice nice changes, like the icon for an MP3 player and the icon for a, a digital camera and a video camera. They look more like real devices. There's a lot of polish gone onto them, clearly. Yeah. I mean, the ones we use now are from Tango Project. Are they? Uh, oh, I'm throwing that out there. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, but okay. If, if you know, email in podcast <laughs> at ubuntu-uk.org. A bug has been filed in the Debian against the Ocular PDF reader, which by default obeys the DRM flags in PDF files. Users can configure the behavior, but some feel that any free software which obeys DRM restrictions is bad. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's again, it's putting the... Well, having said that... It's only it, a flag. It, it is only a flag. And they, turn can, it off. they can disable it. But it's... <laughs> It's respect. I was going to say, oh, it's anything that restricts the user's freedom is bad, blah 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 blah. But also, but it's 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 actually the person who's created the document that has said they don't want this to be editable. Yeah. So should we same- be should we be telling people not to create uneditable PDFs or uh, that you can't copy stuff out of in the first place? Well, in the same way that it's been oh so successful asking people not to create DRM video and doc, doc files. Yeah. 
Right, Luke on the Ubuntu Server mailing list has raised the question of whether the Ubuntu Server training course is overpriced at over two thousand US dollars. This was followed up by Billy Cena soliciting opinions on the subject. Yeah, so they're looking for feedback on what people think is an appropriate cost, and she's broken down you know, the fact that if it's a remote course, not not when we were all sat in a classroom, then there's still some people think there's no cost involved in that, but there's still you know, the infrastructure and someone's going to run the course. So, yeah, it's worth having a look at the thread and uh, maybe contributing your opinions. And we'll link to that in the show notes. Now, time for feedback, I think. And we've had lots of feedback, haven't we? Again. Bucket loads. Shed loads. And we had lots about uh, how free is free, the segment we had in the last episode. Yeah, thankfully, only a minimal number of people were picking over our terminology and uh, the licensing issues. Um, Why, what was that? Share. Correct correct yourself. What was the problem? Um, I can't even remember now. I, I, I glazed over while I was reading the email. It was something to do with uh, the difference between invariant and unchangeable. Oh, Mez emailed us, didn't yeah, it? thanks, Martin. He was quite cross. <laughs> yes, needlessly so, perhaps. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, we heard from a lot of people who use iTunes to download the podcast, because we said last time that a lot of our listeners, or the majority of our listeners, seem to use iTunes to mm. download it, which is odd because we're a Linux-based podcast. A- and actually, I have to mention at this point, After I saw um, or heard, because I wasn't here last time, and I listened to you guys talking about iTunes, I actually thought I'd give it a try. And I mentioned earlier that I used uh, Banshee and Songbird and a few others. I actually thought I'd try iTunes out. So for the last week, I've only been using iTunes to download podcasts to an iPod. And of course, I've been using iTunes under Windows in a virtual machine on Ubuntu, which makes it a little bit slower. Okay. I can conclude... You like it, don't you? I can tell. It's not that I like it. I can see why other people like it, because for the most part, it works. Right. And I, and the fact that I can put an iPod into the docking thing and press the button to synchronize, and all the new podcasts that have been downloaded go onto it, and all the ones I've already listened to get removed. And that's kind of what you want, really, isn't it? That's, yeah. That sounds pretty ideal, really, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I haven't used it for any music-type stuff. I haven't downloaded anything from my, uh, like, uh, the shop. bought anything right. from the shop or anything. But I've just been trying it just to see what the experience is like. And, yeah, it kind of I can see why people like it. Okay. Well, we heard from lots of people about this. And, unfortunately, we haven't got time to read them all out. There was literally that much. Um, lots. Yeah. Um, but among the responses, we heard from Peter, who says he listens as he's driving about in Kent and Sussex on his cheap Woolies MP3 player. And good luck taking that back when it breaks. <laughs> um, he downloads the MP3 files directly from the website. Um, and he only downloads the MP3. The OG is irrelevant because his, his little player only plays MP3 or WAV files. Um, he's used Juicer to convert OGS to MP3 before in the past. Um, but could you? he asked if we could explain the difference for, his, for us thickos, he says, um, between... Um, og and an mp3 no very very briefly they're both compressed formats so you get you get audio and you squeeze it into a smaller file space for downloading um but og is not patent encumbered um or there there is a patent there. in it's, theory in theory yeah whereas mp3 you have to play uh, pay the fraunhofer institute for permission to use the mp3 codec for encoding um so but isn't it also Thompson as well? It's a joint partnership, wasn't it? Is it? Okay. Um, so MP3, has, there are technically fees involved in, in creating devices that play, uh, or, or software that plays um, the... Uh, uh, sorry, no, there's a encodes, cat on my laptop. not plays, encodes. Uh, Playback is yeah. free. Okay. Yeah. So that's the, that's the main difference, really. So OG is free, MP3 is non-free. We also had an email from Andy Bull, uh, and he listens and greatly enjoys the podcast in OG Forbes format. And he downloads it directly from the website onto his Apple iPod, which runs Rockbox, not the standard firmware. Cool. <clears throat> Christian uh, Yuriatsian. Oh, I always get his name. I hope I'll get it right, Chris. Friend um, of the show. Yeah, please send me an email and tell me how to say it properly. Um, how he downloads is determined uh, by the system he's using at the time. Obviously, like most of us, he has uh, many different systems. He uses iTunes on a Mac, MP3 on the Ubuntu to sync with his Walkman, Firefox on Windows three different systems he also mentions that before he moved to ubuntu he read lots of articles and listened to podcasts so itunes users must just be frustrated by windows people looking to switch or dual boot yeah a lot of people saying that we should keep using itunes for inclusivity and making sure that you know getting out the word to new people Mm -hmm. yeah that's basically why we do it to be honest (laughs) i knew there was a reason Simon Weirs is one of the many people who use uh, an iTunes app on his iPhone to download the show and listen on the go. That was one thing we hadn't considered last time, was it? That people are just downloading it straight to their phone without using a computer. Well, 
I had because I looked at the stats. You weren't here. You were sat on a beach in Spain. <laughs> I know. I was shouting at my laptop whilst looking at the stats and listening to you guys talk about it. <laughs> on, a, on a beach in Spain. So he says, so as unfree as it is, keep using iTunes. Otherwise, I'll have to download it onto my computer and need a Windows install to sync it over to my iPhone. And I've spent the past six months slowly phasing out the need for Windows. I have a completely Ubuntu home and I tend to keep it that way. Well done. Fair enough, isn't it? Um, Ian Petit or Petit uh, says he uses iTunes on a Mac as he doesn't currently have a Linux machine at home, but he has recently got more into Ubuntu and uses it exclusively at work. Oh, nice one, Ian. Nice. Um, in preference to Windows, he got his Mac as a Windows replacement a couple of years ago as a first foray into the non-Microsoft world and will soon be getting an additional Ubuntu laptop at home. So it's a bit of a gateway thing. Mm. People going to Mac before they go to Ubuntu. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Apart from some, we're going backwards. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we also had an email from Callum Craig, and he asked two things, but he also goes on to ask, um, I've been thinking about trying to learn a bit of coding, but I've absolutely no idea where to start. Perhaps we should talk about that in the future. Uh, Zach says he uses Ubuntu as his main OS and a Mac Mini for podcasts because he likes browsing through the iTunes store. It's easy, uh, it's well laid out, and I can't read and speak at the same time. Actually, I see what he says about like browsing and finding podcasts. That's the thing that I found when I used iTunes this week. I was subscribing to the usual ones that I usually the Linuxy ones and ours, of course, to test it. And I found the little suggestion thing that says, "If you like that, you'll like this." And I've subscribed to a whole load more uh, really cool podcasts. So it's help you help you find yeah new podcasts totally. And I don't think that happens in. Yeah, because the Rhythm Box, Songbird and Banshee don't have a store kind of thing. Paul from Australia. I think he's written into the show before. I think there, is, there is only one Paul. <laughs> the Paul from Australia has written in saying, um, my podcast used to reside on my Windows notebook, which I used at work and for education purposes. He had to have a Windows machine for doing Dreamweaver. Well, hang on. You can get Dreamweaver on a Mac as well. Um, and other Microsoft-based products. The problem he has now is that he's got lots of material in his iTunes, um, so moving it to another platform would be a big issue. So the basic answer is to use iTunes because it's simple and he, and has a lot of free podcasts. Well, that sounds a, that's lock-in to me, isn't it? You can't just pull it out and um, change it to some other piece of software. I don't know if it's got an export to OPML or whatever thingy on it. I don't know. You can obviously export by writing them all down. We had an identical message from Munch13, and he says, In his humble opinion, uh, avoid Facebook, Twitter, whatever, like the plague. If you're really serious about open source, you've got to show it. Well, that's the problem. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are. We use Identica. Yeah, and we also use non-free um, video drivers. We use non-free wireless drivers, DVB card drivers. So we're not really serious about open source, are we? Uh, uh, it, yeah, you've got, a, I suppose you've got a very good point, actually. Well, no, you can be... I mean, okay, that's you're subscribing to his same idea there, but you can be serious about open source and still be pragmatic. That's my point, yeah. We're pragmatic. I mean, we don't stop people from use it, from getting involved by using just the closed Absolutely. source solution. So if you want to follow us on Identity, you can do. You don't have to. And you, but you don't have to. Um, yep. But you've got the option of using the free one if you want to. Yep. I think that sounds, that's a sensible compromise, isn't it? Mm-hmm. This, yeah, is, I mean, this I mean, isn't the GNU cast or the FSF cast. Yeah, I mean, I'm asking whether Munch 13's uh, plans and design for his car is open source because, you know, he should not have a car or, or, or you know. <laughs> He's got to show he's serious about it. Yeah. Dave Morris says the use of open standards is more important, in his humble opinion, to enable people to make their own choice of what products to use rather than forcing people to use what you think they should use. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but hang on, that's a, that's a little bit convoluted because if we're not forcing people to use what we think they should no, use... No, I think he's just, he's just reinforcing the idea, the proposition that you put that um, if you make it available on iTunes, you should always also make the OGS and the MP3s available via normal RSS. Okay, so it doesn't preclude using yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Another one from Identica, Ralph Green posted uh, to say, open source does matter. After hearing the last show, I went and changed my Myro feed to the OG channel. Uh, nice one, Ralph. Hey. Um, what, we, what we did is there, we've gained an OG viewer using my, uh, Miro or Myro, or whatever you want to say, and then you lost one when so I, actually, I, count- swi- I switched to iTunes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to say, well, he counts as two then. Um, but that kind of summarises all of the different emails we've had on the iTunes, Twitter, Identica debate. So... Thank you for taking the time to email in. Sorry we haven't got time to read them all out, but we've got a lot of other stuff to cover as well. Uh, we also heard from Patrick de Villa, who uh, emailed about the brief comments Davey made about the Myth TV podcast in the last episode. He writes, 
One of you guys mentioned the Myth TV cast on the last episode. I have to admit, I was very disappointed in your comments. First off, myself or my co-host, Dan Frey, have never been one of the Linux action show guys. We Americans must all sound the same to you. Secondly, (laughs) you're free to not like the podcast, but at least give some specific reasons as to why you didn't care for it. I assume you're Myth TV users. What would you like to hear in a Myth TV podcast? At the very least, get your facts straight when discussing other podcasts in a negative manner. Fair point. Yeah, to be fair, it wasn't a planned review. It was just a a, a comment. Ad hoc comment. Yeah, because we got asked what other podcasts we listen to, and Dave mentioned this particular one. Um, But uh, Dave and I are both Myth TV users, although I haven't heard the the Myth TV podcast. Um, So, yeah, uh, I guess... Um, they're not the Linux Action Show guys, or one of them at all. So no, he's um, Pat, for that. Pat's uh, from the Linux Link Tech Show. Uh, yeah, as he says, all the Americans sound the same. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, You're really helping your again. case. Yeah, well done. <laughs> so, um, do, have you got any uh, further comments that we'd like to elucidate a little bit more about what you uh, didn't quite get in terms of the Myth TV cast? Uh, it was it was very uh, US centric. Was uh, was was one uh, thing I noticed, but also the actual um, as I as I'm sure I actually said in the previous show, it was such a a tight area to discuss. And I even said we were worried about our podcast being just about Ubuntu, but but potentially being too Mm. tight. Now I'm, I'm, I I still feel satisfied that a podcast just about myth, myth TV is, 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 there's not enough activity to to keep it sustained. Mm. But good luck to them if they think they can do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not stopping them from yeah, doing yeah. it. You know, I, I, mean, actually, I, I, I I'm I'm allowed to express my own opinion. Yeah, sure, and, yeah, and, yeah. I, and I didn't. And I mean, he says, you know, at least get your facts straight when you're discussing a negative manner. So that means we don't have to have our facts straight when it's a positive manner. <laughs> Is that what he's insinuating? <laughs> I don't know. Asa emailed in to lay the how many people use Ubuntu or Fedora question to rest. Another one, hopefully, we will sort of say goodbye to after this one. Saying he uses Fedora on his work laptop for a couple of reasons. It's easy to set up, um, has full disk encryption, although Ubuntu's now got that as well. And it's similar to his CentOS servers that he has at work. It's got SE Linux built in. And at home, he uses Arch uh, and Debian. Um, he hasn't used Ubuntu seriously in a couple of years, despite being a loyal listener. That's great. I love the fact that we have people using everything but Ubuntu. <laughs> um, in addition, out of the six sysadmins, he works with five run Fedora. The other one uses Gentoo. Um, and Asa suggests he must get a sick pleasure from getting paid to watch stuff compile. That's quite a good work avo- avoidance tactic, actually. Um, he knows a couple of other Fedora users as well, and he only knows two people that use Ubuntu. So he's flipping our coin back on us there. Um, I guess you guys are living in a happy brown orange Ubuntu bubble. <laughs> Thank you, Asa. Yes, we are. Yeah. Um, yes, we, we uh, appreciate there are a lot of Fedora users out there. We were all very tongue in cheek last episode, and uh, hopefully that lays that one to rest as well. Right, we've got an email from Peter. Email to tell us about uh, a website he uses, which um, still does user agent detection. Uh, that's Ooh. Manchester United. So apparently their match cast streams uh, require certain browsers to be used. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, you also mentioned that uh, he likes your podcast. Very interesting. Um, what he understands of them. Join the club. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm presenting. Um, uh, not being quite a newbie, he's getting uh, the hang of Ubuntu and spreading the word. Good man. Um, I don't know anything about the code, uh, nor am I interested, um, but I use and like Ubuntu. I have an Ubuntu stick on the back of my car, which has faded. Nice one, canonical. Um, (laughs) Not a very good advert. He's a field engineer repairing office equipment uh, and hasn't met anybody who uses Ubuntu. Um, Wow. You should wear a T-shirt. Anyway. Yeah, but no, if he's in the field, he might need a coat. I mean, he doesn't know what the weather's going to be like. (laughs) Um. He asks every IT man he meets uh, if they know anything about Linux, and they all deny any knowledge of it. Um, He doesn't know uh, if that's uh, because they know what's coming. I have a problem. Can you help? Uh, However, uh, he uses open office on uh, the company laptops. uh, That's good. Which I do at work as well. Yeah, Yeah, nice and sneaky. Um, Perhaps you could do a newbie section or appoint uh, listeners where to find how-tos. I have a plan. Yeah, we've been talking about this, and we'll hopefully have something for you in the next episode. Next episode. Sounds a bit exciting, though, doesn't it? It does. And that about wraps up our feedback. So that brings us to the end of the show. Indeed. Thank you for listening. And thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. Not so much of that going on this time because of the interview and things we had going on in the show. But uh, good to have your questions for the uh, Open Learning Centre guys. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845 508 1986. You can send us your comments on Identica via identity.ca slash UUPC or Twitter, which is twitter.com slash UUPC, as well as getting updates from recording sessions. 
Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash Ubuntu-UK channel on the Freenode IRC network. Find our fan page on Facebook, search for Ubuntu UK Podcast, and just to give you an update on the stats, we have broken the 100 barrier. Really? I think we are about 108 last time I checked. Wow. <laughs> we welcome suggestions, material, tips, reviews, or rants, and feedback, both positive and negative, so please do get in touch. Thanks also to our network of community mirrors, which are listed on the website. Are they really? They yeah. are really, yeah. really. Have we got the names right? I think, I think we have anyway. <laughs> haven't had any other complaints or snotty emails. <laughs> Well, that's it for this time. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.